the 18th chapter of the book of St. Matthew, verses 1 through 6 and verse 14. St. Matthew, the 18th chapter, the first through the sixth verse and the 14th verse, and we will be reading from the King James Version. Those of us who are armed, uh, let us take our time and read these verses together on this National Children's Sunday, Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 through 6 and verse 14. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called the little child unto him, and set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted, and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name, receiveth me. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and that he would drown in the depth of the sea. Verse 14, even so it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven, that one of these little ones should perish. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Let us ponder for a few moments this subject, a kingdom destiny for children. Will you say that with me? A kingdom destiny for children. Thank God for this day in which we as God's people align ourselves with the kingdom priorities of Christ. For the Lord Jesus is approached by his disciples being motivated and driven by their ambition. Each one of them seemed to have had their own succession plan. You and I understand that it is not enough for one to experience success, but that one must also plan for succession. Anyone that does not have in place a plan for succession is one who is indeed setting themselves up for failure. The saying is true, no one plans to fail. They simply fail to plan. There has never been a greater planner than God. Even before the foundation of the world, he had already predestinated us in Christ. He had a place for us in the kingdom before we were conceived. He had a purpose for each one of our lives. In fact, it is that purpose that literally calls us into existence. We are born because God meant for us to be born when we were born, how we were born. God has not once had an accident. In fact, God doesn't even have accidents. And because you're his child, you have to be careful with the words that you use concerning events in your life. 
if God doesn't have accidents and you are his child being led by his spirit, your steps ordered by the Lord, all things working together for good because you love God and are the call according to his purpose, you don't have accidents either. You may have incidents, but those incidents are carefully integrated into God's master plan. And what you thought may have happened inadvertently, somehow God already knew about it. <laughs> and because God had the foreknowledge of it, even when your foot slipped, even when you almost fell, even when you were almost destroyed, God stepped in because his plan overrules the enemy's plan. Not only do you not have accidents, you are not an accident. Don't let anybody tell you that you are an accident because that's somebody that doesn't know you like God knows you. God knows you better than your mother. He knows you better than your father. He knows you better than the system. He even knows the hairs on your head, your uprising, your down sittings. He knows your end from the beginning. And because God knows you so well, it would be good for you to get to know the God that knows you so you can let him tell you about yourself. I am who God says I am. Come on, help me give God some praise this morning. Each one of these disciples had their own succession plan. Obviously, Peter had his own succession plan because he was one that was always angling for the spotlight, for the megaphone, always wanting to be heard, even if it meant trying to drown out Jesus himself. For when Jesus tells them, I'm going to be crucified, I'm going to be put to death, by the very people that I love and came to save. Peter says, I, I have another opinion. That's not going to happen to you. And Jesus had to let him know, don't let the devil use your mind. Don't let the devil use your mouth. In fact, Jesus rebuked the spirit of takeover, the spirit of manipulation and control that Peter had and said, you savor not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. When God wants you to be elevated, he knows your number, he knows your address, he knows how and where to find you. The thing for you to do is wait on the Lord. Uh, not this wait, but this wait. That's serving. You've been to a good restaurant before, and they give you a server or a waiter. And that's what God wants you to do is be his server or waiter. And they that serve the Lord, who are faithful to him, anchored in his will and purpose, you don't have to worry. In God's own time, he will promote you. Promotion doesn't come from the north, the south, the east, or the west, but promotion comes from God. And he always starts from the bottom up. He that exalteth himself shall be abased, but he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. God knows when to lift you up. He knows when you can stand it. He knows when you can bear it. For when God raises you up, you understand new levels, new devils. God can't raise you up until he prepares you to deal with another level of opposition, a higher level of warfare. In God's own time, a change will come. James and John had their own succession plan, and they used their mother, Mother Zebedee, to announce it. 
just after Jesus says that he's going to the cross. Mother Zebedee doesn't mention it because that's really not what she wants. She doesn't want a cross for her sons, an execution, a lynching, a public humiliation. She wants glory for her son. She wants a seat of honor. She wants recognition and celebration. And that is why she submits to Jesus a grant request. You may not be able to say amen to that. Just say, hmm. It's good to have some grant writers around because there are funds available. You have to know how to compete for those funds. Uh, Mother Zebedee says, grant that these my two sons may sit one on your right hand and on your left. Not now, not before you go to the cross, not when you're getting ready to suffer, to be mocked and scourged and crucified. I don't want my boys going through that. But when you get that behind you, that's when I want you to approve my grant request. My grant is that my sons will be at your right and left hand when you finally succeed and achieve success. But she didn't understand that every grant involves matching funds. Matching funds then says, what do you bring to the grant application? How much money are you going to raise? What is your plan for capacity building? What kind of in-kind donations? How many volunteer hours are you investing into this grant request? They didn't have anything to put down with the grant. No time, no resources, uh, no hours of investing for volunteering, not even their bodies, spirit, soul. All we want are some seats. And there are some people who are very interested in good seats. In fact, even if you go to an orchestra, you pay more for the good seats. If you go to a play, you pay more to sit close to the action. But Jesus is saying, I don't want you to have good seats. I want you to be a part of the action. You're not ready to sit down yet. You haven't done anything yet. Before you sit down, put your time in. The older saints said, if you put your time in, payday is coming after a while. The succession plan of the sons of Zebedee was when Jesus has finished the work, then you step in and try to claim what you had nothing to do with him accomplishing. And that is why in Matthew 18 and 1, we find all the disciples submitting their own plan for succession. Since you're going to talk about dying and being crucified, being put to death, their limited understanding did not allow them to incorporate the resurrection into their understanding of Christ. They didn't see Jesus coming through this. They didn't see him rising from the dead, defeating sin, death, hell, and the grave. They didn't see him as Bishop Blake used to say in the future looking better than he did right then. All they could see was themselves in positions of influence. That is why they asked this question, Master who is the greatest in the kingdom? And that means they really stepped out of their place. It's not a good idea to even ask that question in the church. It's not a good thing to even try to position yourselves for greatness in the church. Certainly you don't want to run God's kingdom and tell God you want to be the greatest in the kingdom because he will then have to explain to you how the kingdom functions. 
and Jesus had to throw them a curve. You are 12 grown men angling for positions. But you don't understand where my emphasis is in the kingdom. You don't even value children. When mothers brought their children to me, you're the ones that tried to run those mothers away. Erroneously telling them, I don't have time for children. You're the ones that don't even bring children into the equation. You are supposed to be my disciples, my followers. Where are your children? Did you bring your children with you? Did you bring your family? Do you bring them to the prayer meeting? Do you bring them to the altar? Do you share my kingdom teachings with them? Do you think I just called you to be a disciple? When I called you, I called your whole family. Even Joshua said, ask for me and my house. We will serve the Lord. You need to Remember, God put you into a place of trust, responsibility, and accountability. Bring someone with you. Share the love of God with someone else. Invest your experience with someone else. Share your testimony with someone else that God in you will bring them into a relationship with the kingdom. They thought Jesus was actually going to pick one of them to be the greatest in the kingdom. Jesus threw them a curve, turned their whole plan upside down. They didn't even expect this while they are jockeying and positioning themselves to jump in front of another. Jesus has the nerve to bring a little child. And then he took this little child and put that child front and center. And then he emphasized the validity of this truth by saying verily, I say unto you, except you be converted, that means changed, regenerated, your faith placed in a God who even transformed your mind and nature. What Jesus was implying, you haven't even been converted yet. And you want to be greatest in the kingdom? You haven't even submitted your will to God yet. You haven't even fallen in line with my teachings yet. You really don't believe in me yet. You don't even know me yet. You don't even worship me yet. And you want to grab the spotlight the microphone positions and you don't even know Jesus yet. Jesus says, except you be converted, except you change your ways, your attitude, your mind, your disposition, your emphasis, you're not going to have to worry about being great in the kingdom because you ain't going to even get in the kingdom. Hello? Jesus has some nerve. You got to have authority to teach like that. You have to have validity to teach like that. Jesus wants them to understand God's kingdom emphasis upon children. We would do well to reflect that, especially in as much as the data and statistics demonstrate that the United States has the highest infant mortality rate among black women than any other developed nation in the world, that we have fewer midwives, that we lose two-thirds of mothers in postpartum periods. The fact is that the death of infants and black mothers rivals that of developing nations. 
In America, obviously, we don't really love children because we pull too many guns in our communities, work overtime making and marketing guns, even allowing guns in the hands of people who have mental disabilities. Our children are vulnerable at schools because schools keep getting shot up. And even when they get shut up, there are members of Congress who can only say our thoughts and prayers are with them. I ain't never saw you pray. Never saw you pray on the floor of Congress. Never saw you pray in the Senate. You have a little short prayer by a chaplain and you give them a certain amount of time and dare them to use the name Jesus. And when children are being massacred in our schools, you got the nerve to talk about our thoughts and prayer. Now what about a change in laws? What about you stopping ghost guns? What about you stopping AK-47 from being sold on the streets. We don't love children in this country and that is why we stand in danger of the wrath and judgment of God. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all nations that forget God as if that were not enough. Even certain houses of worship seem to ignore the importance and significance of children. You know, we are still growing. Life is a learning experience as long as God has you on this earth. You are not too old to change. You are not too old to broaden your experience. You are not too old to be enlightened by the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. Didn't God get a senior citizen by the name of Nicodemus who is an applicant to be in God's kingdom and before God would let an old man even get in the kingdom he hadn't even mentioned the church yet is kingdom Nicodemus if you want to be in the kingdom except one be born again you can't even see the kingdom of God yes the church ought to be a place that is child friendly I don't believe that the church should tolerate any level of child abuse, neglect. I don't believe that the church should allow an environment of predatory individuals being around children because you have one chance to be innocent. You have one opportunity to grow up. And that is why parents need to tenaciously guard your child's innocence. Protect them. Stand between them and danger. Pray with them. Pray for them. Teach them God's love for them. Remind them Jesus loves you. I'm glad to know that Jesus loves me. Aren't you glad that Jesus loves you? If we want to change the world, start with children. If you want to change the future, start with children. If you want to reduce drug addiction, start with children. If you want to combat violence, start with children. If you want to break up gangs, start with children. If a child is saved, that's a soul saved plus a life. God doesn't just want your soul saved. He wants your life saved. He wants to keep you in his purpose and will. He wants you to develop a lifelong trust in him. Jesus places emphasis upon children. Yes, the only time as Bishop Lewis Henry Ford used to say to look down on a child is when you are reaching down to pick that child up. Children ought to be blessed, elevated, encouraged, prayed for. Children are an heritage of the Lord. Jesus had to rebuke 
an anti-child mentality. Jesus had to confront spirits even around the church that thought children were insignificant. I know that in times past we thought that children were to be seen and not heard. Children were not integrated into decision making. But does not the Bible say submitting yourselves one to another? Ephesians 5, 21, I know we rush past that verse, trying to get to the next verse, wives, obey your husband, but you left out something, submitting yourselves one to another. That means the wife has something to say, listen, children have something to say, listen. Every now and then, God reminds us of how much he loves children. For he says, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, God gets perfect praise. Was not it the praise of Moses when he was hid in an ark of the bulrushes in the Nile River that changed his destiny forever? Moses had no idea what was hanging over his head. He didn't know that he was already a fugitive and grown men were seeking to cut off his head. He's just a child being hid by a Jewish mother, watched over by his sister Miriam, hid in an ark among the bulrushes. But he didn't know Pharaoh's daughter is getting ready to bathe herself in the waters of the Nile River. And while Pharaoh's daughter was washing herself, God subconsciously said to that baby, now is the time to praise me. Moses began to open his mouth and cry. God got in the cry and took the voice of this child to the ears of Pharaoh's daughter. She said, where's that coming from? Where's that child? And when she found this goodly child, the Bible says, she looked into his eyes and said, I can't let this child die. I know that the system is designed to kill children. In fact, it's my daddy that wants to kill this baby. But I'm not going to let this baby die. I'm going to take this baby baby home with me. I'm going to name this baby Moses because I drew him out of the Nile River. I'm going to educate this baby not knowing God was using her to bring deliverance to the people of Israel. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, God gets perfect praise. Was not it a child in Eli's house when the Bible says the glory of God had departed from Israel? And that is why one of Eli's sons had a child with a woman who, when fleeing from war and destruction, fell. And the child was injured, and she named the child Ichabod, which means the glory of God has departed. And because God's glory left Israel, because Eli would not discipline his own house, God said, I'm going to raise up a child. Hannah was a barren woman. Hannah had been called cursed all her life. Hannah couldn't bring forth any children, but she went to the convocation. And in those days, the convocation was 
20 days and nights. The convocation was held at Shiloh, where Shiloh is the right place. For when Jacob was on his dying bed, he gave a prophecy to Judah and said to his son Judah, the scepter shall not depart from Israel, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. Who is Shiloh? Jesus is Shiloh. The convocation was held at Shiloh for 20 days and nights. Hannah said, I'm going to the convocation, but I'm going in sackcloth and ashes. I'm going to cry because if we're going to change the future, we got to start with the children. If we're going to change God's house, we got to start with the future. Lord, if you give me a baby, I'll give him back to you. If you give me a son, I'll consecrate him to you. She cried at the altar at Shiloh. She prayed. Her lips were moving, but she wasn't speaking loud because they didn't want to hear women speaking in that place. But God will hear you even if you don't raise your voice. God will hear you even even if it's only in your heart, he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or we can think. If you don't have the courage to ask, think it. If you don't have the boldness to ask, think it. Think. I know God will. Think. I know God loves me. Think. I know God will bless me. Think. I know God will make a way for me. Think. I know my God shall supply my need according to his riches in glory. Think. He's a healer. Think. He's a deliverer. Think. He's a devil driver. If you think on God, God will give you the desires of your heart. He will keep those in perfect peace whose mind stayed on him. Woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. Walking and talking with my mind stayed on Jesus. Singing and praying with my mind stayed on Jesus. Come on and touch somebody and tell them, thank it if you want a blessing. Thank it if you want a miracle. Thank it if you want a breakthrough. Thank it. Oh Lord, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Hannah said, I'm thinking about the future. I'm thinking God's got a ram. I'm thinking God will raise up a new generation. Eli said, what's wrong with you, woman? You must be drunk. But she said, I'm not drunk. I know the lights are out. I know what Ichabod means. It means the glory of God is departed. It means God has left us. It means the lights are out. It's dark in here, Eli. And you don't even know the difference. I'm not drunk. I'm praying. My desires are on God's altar. A few months later, she came back God answered my prayer God gave me a miracle baby God even in my advanced years bless me to bring forth I'm bringing my baby back to the altar back to God mothers fathers God parents foster parents bring those children to God tell them about Jesus 
Jesus. Tell them he's your friend. He's your keeper. He's your provider. He's your purpose. He's your plan. Tell your children to love Jesus. God raised up Samuel to be the last judge or not the first king or not the second king or not Saul or not David. If you are not David, it's going to get on Jesus. Jesus, the son of God, son of David, out to the throne. He knows how much God loves children. Jesus, the reason why I know it I was a child conceived by the Holy Ghost in the virgin womb of Mary, a rejected child, a hated child. I'm the seed of the woman that bruises the serpent's heel. You want to be great? Become as this little child. Humble yourself before God. And every now and then, remind the Lord, Lord, I am your child, Lord, I am your responsibility, Lord, I am your property, Lord, I belong to you, Lord, protect me, provide for me, promote me, put your arms around me, I am a child of the king say yes say yes come on help me give god some praise i am a child of the king jesus says since you are a child of the king you ought to pray like it how i'm gonna do that jesus i'm gonna teach you how to pray a prayer of kingdom destiny a prayer of kingdom prosperity a prayer of kingdom purpose well you got to change your pronouns I said, you got to change your pronoun. What are your pronouns? My pronouns are not he, him, his, me, mine. That's not my pronouns. My pronouns are we, us, our. Jesus said, if you're going to pray as my child, change your pronouns. Our father, that means he don't, not just your daddy, he's my daddy, not just your mama, he's my mama, my keeper, my guide, my savior, my redeemer, our why don't you bring somebody with you? Come on and help me with this. Look at somebody and say, I'm bringing you with me. Come on, Ella Johnson. I'm bringing you with me. Ow. What you mean? I can't ask the Lord to bless me without saying, Lord, bless Ella Johnson. I can't ask the Lord, Lord, save me without saying, Lord, save the Johnson family. Bring. Come on, grab arm with somebody. Lock arm with somebody and say, come on with me to the throne of grace. Come on with me to God's altar. Come on with me to God's throne. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Give us not just Felton. Give us. Give Johnson. Give Norwood. Give Sneed. Give Lundy. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. If you mess with Johnson, you're messing with me. If you mess with Sneed, you're messing with me. Give us 
protection. Give us anointing. Give us favor. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Lord, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us. Don't just deliver me. Deliver us. Deliver our children. Deliver our grandchildren. Deliver our community. Deliver our schools. Deliver us. Yes, Lord. Tell him yes. Tell him yes. Tell him yes. Tell him yes. Come on and give God some praise up in here. Tell him yes. Tell him yes. Yes, Lord. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. I'm too close to the altar. Not to bow my knees. Too close to the altar, not to humble myself. Too close to the altar, not to lay my burdens down. Oh, too close to the altar, not to submit my all to Jesus. Oh, Lord, I'm your child. Oh, Lord, I'm your property. Oh, Lord, I'm your responsibility. Oh, Lord, I believe in you. I trust you. I love you. I worship you. I honor you. Oh, Lord. I love your name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Come on, let's tell him thank you. Let us give God thanks. Eternal God, our Father, we bless you for this opportunity to reach souls around the world. May you continue to bind us closer together in the love of Jesus Christ. As your word says, now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. May the power of the Holy Spirit move upon our lives that we may fulfill our kingdom assignment. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.